So welcome to HKBU School of Communication and Film's uh, Distinguished Research Seminar Series. Today is our great pleasure to have Professor Nashia Contractor. Professor Contractor is the Jane William White Professor of Behavioral Sciences at the McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science, the School of Communication, and the Kellogg School of Management and Director of the Science of Networks in Communities Research Group at Northwestern University. He is the president-elect of the International Communication Association. He is also a prestigious ICA fellow. Professor Contractor has been at the forefront of three emerging interdisciplines, network science, computational social science, and web science. His award-winning book, Theories of Communication Networks, is a classic. I think many of our students attending uh, the research seminars today a very familiar this book. Actually, it is one of the required textbook uh, for my network uh, course um, last semester and the past years. So um, today is really our great pleasure to have him here. And he also received the Distinguished Scholar Award from the National Communication Association and the Lifetime Service Award from the Organizational Communication and Information Systems Divisions of the Academy of Management. Today, the talk of Professor Contractor's uh, um, talk today is people analytics using digital exhaust from the web to leverage network insights in the algorithmically infused workplace. So without further ado, I will pass the floor to Professor Contractor. Thank you so much, Celine, and thank you for all of you for inviting me to be a uh, part of this uh, distinguished series. It is truly an honor to, to join you here today. And, uh, I'm, I'm, I hope that uh, in the future, we will have opportunities to do this again in person uh, in Hong Kong. Um, I have to tell you that uh, I have a fondness for Hong Kong Baptist, even though I have not personally visited, but my mentor and the co-author of the book that Celine talked about, Theories of Communication Networks, Peter Manji, has been uh, uh, telling me about Hong Kong Baptist University for a long time, um, ever since he was actually, if I remember correctly, um, was invited to be one of the external reviewers of the communication program at Hong Kong Baptist Universities. This is, I'm, I think it's going back maybe maybe two decades. I'm not sure how long ago it was, but uh, Peter Manji and Janet Folk were both uh, uh, in Hong Kong and spent a lot of time uh, in your department and have been great fans of it and keep talking about it. So I'm delighted that now uh, I too am able to connect directly with uh, Hong Kong Baptist University. So thank you again. Uh, the, the, the presentation I'm going to talk about today is titled, as, you, as Celine mentioned, People Analytics uh, Using Digital Exhaust from the Web to Leverage Network Insights in the Algorithmically Infused Workplace. That's quite a mouthful. But let's see if we can unpack that a little bit. And I'm going to try to, Celine, correct me if I'm wrong, do you want me to speak for about 40 minutes, less, more? Because we have a whole hour, right? Is that correct? Uh, 40 minutes or one hour, uh, it's OK. OK. So I will try to go through it, and, and I do invite anyone to ask questions along the way, even if it is in the chat. I will do my best to monitor the chat as we go along here. So I've, we've all got quite good at that. So if you want to put a question in the chat, don't hesitate to do that. If you want to raise your hand, maybe Celine can uh, track it more easily than I can. I might be able to see someone raising their hand as well. So either way, I would be uh, happy to take questions of clarification or anything along the way. So with that said, uh, let me go ahead, Celine. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I, I, I say it, it sounds great. OK, sounds wonderful yeah. then. OK, so I want to first of all, first of all, I would want to start by saying that uh, many people who study communication uh, and uh, especially outside of the United States normally equate communication with mass communication, uh, mass media and journalism. And, um, and of course, that is very much central to the field of communication. But uh, what may be less uh, clear to many uh, around the world, perhaps not at Hong Kong Baptist, is that we um, that communication is, is in, in many other areas. And my talk today is going to focus about the role of communication at work. So it's not mass communication. It's not misinformation and disinformation. Uh, but in fact, it's about communication at work, which is where we spend a certain proportion of our life, a substantial proportion of our life every year. So with that as backdrop, um, I want to go to the next slide. 
um, where we see that technology has been very influential in the changing nature of the work going back at least from the 1990s, uh, but certainly before that as well. But in the 1990s, there's been a really accelerated change uh, about how these things play out. Um, it first started with things like you'd moved away from email and come to things like groupware. People talked about hardware and software, and then someone says, no, but you have special uh, uh, programs and platforms to support groups and teams. And then that led to the intranets as opposed to the internet, and that led to social computing. It led to creating of crowdsourcing platforms uh, like Threadless uh, and, and Mechanical Turk. Then that led to clouding that happened in the workplace. And more recently, we have seen that crowdsourcing has now evolved into what is called as enterprise social media. So what exactly is enterprise social media? Enterprise social media is basically taking the notion of social media as we understand it from uh, the web, from social networks, and taking that and putting it into the workplace. So if you think about Facebook and Twitter that we use in our social life, what we have seen in the last decade is taking those same ideas, but putting it within the context of work. And that's where we have things like Slack, Jira, uh, Microsoft Teams, Yammer, Zoom, Jive, uh, Microsoft Office 365 overall. And all of these are trying to see how we can take the same ideas that we did on platforms like social media and Twitter, I mean, in platforms like social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, and apply that into the context of the workplace, where now if you have used Slack, you know that you can uh, go on walls, you can post on a wall, you can add mention someone, you can like something, you can, um, you can uh, share your ideas with groups of people, um, and you can also observe what other people are doing. What this has done is it's fundamentally changed how we observe what is happening at work. In the old days, when we were in an open office, we could see who was talking to whom, who hung out with whom at the water cooler, who sat with whom at the cafeteria. But then when we went virtual and technological and did emails, which were private messages sent between individuals, we lost that ambient information that is so important and vital in helping us know who knows who and who knows what. And so what the new social media, enterprise social media has done is it has created a whole bunch of new technological affordances. For example, one of them would be association. By looking at the wall, by looking at Facebook, you know who knows who and who knows what. Certainly that is true in the workplace when you look at tools like Slack and Teams. Likewise, it, it provides you more insight into evaluability. You now know who likes what posting, who likes what accomplishment, who doesn't like something. All of this now becomes much more visible because we're interacting in a social context as opposed to a private one-on-one -on -one email context. It increases overall visibility. You see how people have responded to questions raised by others. You have the sense of persistence that even if you were not there at the moment a discussion was happening, you could go back later on and take a look at it. You can see what the conversation was about. And of course, you're able to personalize it by presenting the, yourself in a way that you would like. So this is sometimes called in the Irving Goffman sense, the presentation of self in everyday life. You get to decide what your front stage looks like and you get to personalize that. And these are not all. The next set continue this technological affordances. Editability, you're able to go back and revise information others provide than others have shared. We've all seen the benefits of doing Google Docs and shared editing. Pervasiveness, a lot of these tools today are applicable, are uh, not only available to us on the desktop, but are available to us on our, on our mobile devices. And so wherever we are, anywhere, it is pervasive. We are always able to add and, and modify issues. It makes us aware of the information and updates from others. Um, just like we do on Facebook, where we say, oh, so-and-so just got an award, so-and-so just took a new job. All of those kinds of information updates now is now available in the organization in real time. And second to last, searchability. It is so important today that we don't need to remember any websites. We don't need to remember a conversation. As long as we have keywords, we can immediately filter all of the social media that we have to decide to find out information about a particular topic. And then last but not the least, and probably the most used is the ability to create groups on the fly. So if we are working and we want three of us to get together and talk about a particular episode, we are finalizing this paper, uh, we can very easily create a group on the fly that three of us are gonna have, we'll work on it for a short period of time, and then it's over. So this ability to create these sort of 
small groups to share, to coordinate. These are all fundamental ways in which uh, enterprise social media is changing the way we work. And guess what? It's not just technological affordances. There's a new sort of affordance that's now on the horizon. And that is what I'm calling as algorithmic affordances. Algorithmic affordances are where you have technologies that are not just making it easy for us to know what other people are doing, but they are often making it possible for us to have recommendations. So this cartoon that says, so the software doesn't tell you to do things. And if you think about it, we are living in that world already. Recommend assistants are great examples of that. It tells us if you want this, would you be interested in that? It tells us about how based on certain algorithms, certain people are more likely to be potentially good job candidates. Even at schools and universities today, algorithms are being used by admissions committees to identify which students are likely to have a high potential of success. It's, it's being used in a lot of different contexts in, around the world. And therefore, we need to see how these algorithmically infused societies are changing the way we understand work. And that's why uh, these are two articles that I was very honored to be a co-author on, one on the left, uh, titled Measuring Algorithmically Infused Society was published earlier this year in Nature magazine. And on the right, an article called Computational Social Science, Obstacles and Opportunities was published in Science uh, last year. The article on the right was really a, a, a revisit of an article that we published back in 19, um, 1991, I believe it was. Uh, no, it was two, sorry, in 2009. Yeah, uh, we published an article in 2009, we published an article in science that was simply titled Computational Social Science. And that article became a very important article, much to my surprise, frankly, at helping launch that entire area of computational social science. So 10 years forwards, we thought we should go back there. Many of the same authors um, went back and a few new authors came in to see what have we learned in about 10 to 11 years and where can we take it from here? And so what do we mean by algorithmically affordance, algorithmic affordances? So a concrete example <clears throat> in the workplace is how we assemble teams. We all have heard of dating apps and matrimonial uh, apps like Tinder and eHarmony and Match.com. And I'm sure that you have several of your own good ones in Hong Kong that help uh, uh, set up ways in which you can do matchmaking. Um, I, I recall when I've been to uh, cities in uh, places like Hong Kong and in Shanghai, in many cases, the traditional ways in which matrimony happens is when there are arranged couples where the parents and the families will sometimes assemble in open areas with placards with the names of their uh, prospective brides and grooms and try to do matchmaking. Today, a lot of that is being done online. And so one of the things that we can learn from that is if we can do online matchmaking, why can't we do online team making, assembling of teams online? And that's beginning to become, it's becoming quite an interesting idea. So we have some teams that could be self um, assembled. And then there are some teams that are staffed where someone else staffed the team. That's one continuum. On the other continuum, we have teams where you, we search for people that we want to form our teams with. But in other cases, the computer, the algorithm is providing us with suggestions of what teams might be more or less successful. So how do we then study this process? And so I'm gonna give you a preview of a study that I will show you the results towards the end of the talk. If you wanna understand who, who we invite on a team, we know from past research that we try to invite people who have project skills. That makes sense. I want somebody who's skilled. I, wanna inv I tend to invite people of the same, who are birds of a feather, people like me, for example, people of the same gender. We know that based on past research, this is true. We also know that on, based on past research, we like to invite people who we have previously collaborated with. That's because familiarity matters. We like the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. The question though is from an algorithmically recommendation point of view, how does the presence of a recommendation on a list change who you may invite? That's this line that shows, it. do we take recommendations of people who are suggested to us? The second question, which I think is also a puzzle, is how does that recommendation impact us, impact our decision of who to invite? If the recommendation is about somebody that we previously knew, as opposed to a stranger, is the recommendation going to be more valuable in helping me if it was for somebody I previously knew? Or is it 
if I, it is for a recommendation for someone I didn't know? Hold the answer to that. We'll come back to that later on when we go back to it. But before we go further, this, I just wanted to give this as a concrete example of the kind of work that we need to better understand. Which brings us back to the whole idea of how we can reimagine theories and methods to understand and enable the algorithmically infused changing nature of work. And so I'll touch quickly on how the data that we have now, the digital exhaust that I had in the title of this talk, how that is changing the ways in which we are theorizing about what happens in the workplace. In particular, an example would be, it allows us to take existing theories, but now we are able to test it at scale. Previously, we could not. A simple example of this would be things like contagion. We've known that we do things based upon our networks. We are, influ we are influenced by our networks. Even though today contagion is talked more about in the context of the pandemic, we know that social complex contagion is a well-known factor. But here is an article that was published in Nature Communication, which I find fascinating because it used digital trace data at scale. It used our ability to be on using these wrist uh, wearable devices like Fitbits um, and use it to study to what extent is my exercise activity going to be influenced by the exercise activity of people in my social network. Well, it turns out that my, uh, the influence of my social network is not surprisingly, it's going to be about uh, that if, I, if my friends exercise more, I'm going to do the same thing. However, what was interesting about this article is it said, yes, but there's another interesting nuance. It turns out that, that the article written here by Sinan and Christos uh, found that I'm more likely to be motivated to exercise, not by somebody who's a little fitter than me, but by somebody who's a little less fit than me. So in other words, my network is influencing me more because I want to keep, make sure that I stay ahead of the person right behind me than try to overtake the person ahead of me. That's an interesting insight about how we are influenced by our social network. And getting the data at scale was able to provide for the first time, those kinds of insights. We've also seen how these can be uh, un to help us understand new phenomena like collective intelligence, for example, that is becoming so popular in different contexts. I talked about crowdsourcing. Well, the incentives to do this can also be collected. We don't know much about this phenomena because it's not happened very much. But now we have the ability to study new theories about relatively new phenomena. I'll talk more about the second example, your team assembly. But this is a great article that was published uh, on looking at the role of optimal incentives for collective intelligence. Further, we can also see how theories can start taking on new variables that we did not consider before. Most of the work in social networks so far has looked at social network data, even if it is digital trace data, just as I was describing. Today, people like Emily Falk at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania and her colleagues are beginning to see how social networks are being influenced by networks in the brain and how networks in the brain are in turn influencing our social networks. So we have a whole new opportunity to theorize about social networks by connecting it to the physiological underpinnings of networks in our brains. And that again provides a brand new opportunity for us to theorize about issues like communication networks. In addition to reimagining theories, we can reimagine data. We now have access to large digital trace repositories. Uh, this was a study that we did a long time ago, looking at the ways in which uh, we can look at digital trace data in virtual worlds, whether it is worlds like League of Legends or EVE Online, uh, World of Warcraft. Um, these are all places where people spend a lot of time and we are able to see, get from these worlds, a lot of information about individuals who they interact with, who they decide to team up with, when do they kill monsters, how do they buy things, how do they trade in these environments. So it's, an, it's a wonderful uh, sort of opportunity for us to, a crucible for us to understand the nature and the motivation of human and social dynamics. Uh, we also have obviously crowdsourcing platform, platforms, Jive, uh, Kaggle, uh, GitHub. Um, these are all opportunities for us to see why is it that people come together on, on platforms like Kaggle and who competes with whom to win certain prizes? How do they team up on it? So we can learn a lot about team dynamics from crowdsourcing platforms. And even though these were set up to do other things like 
uh, organized competitions, we are able to use those to understand digital trace data. And of course, today we have a lot of these facility, uh, uh, platforms that are being used in a variety of different cases. Microsoft has actually taken its own Microsoft Teams data and its Office 365 and stood up an inside Microsoft platform called Viva, which takes the metadata from that we generate on platforms like Teams and tells us about the extent to which, uh, who are we emailing with? How much are we working? Are we experiencing burnout? Are we spending too much time spending uh, focusing on our screens? These are all issues that they are able to now provide us back as in insights to us based on our use of platforms like Microsoft Teams. I, I, I just mentioned to you Kaggle.com is another wonderful site that one of my former students actually, Marlon Wyman, is actually uh, doing some recent work looking at how Kaggle can tell us a lot about the nature of how people are forming teams and, and uh, how they are using it to signal their strengths and expertise and how that then in turn uh, impacts their future employability. Um, and then of course we get data from sensors. We are increasingly using badges where we are able to get badges that tell us about what are called sociometric badges. It tells us unobtrusively who we are connecting with. Uh, it tells us our energy level, uh, the, who we are speaking with, what's, what's our physical activity, et cetera. And all of this has been used by the Media Lab at MIT to actually make predictions uh, about which team is going to be doing better than other teams because of the energy associated with the people wearing these kinds of badges. Um, and then again, just as I mentioned, when it comes to theories, we are now thinking of theories that involve uh, the brain networks. We now have data sources like MRI and other approaches where we are able to collect relatively easily by putting on the skull cap opportunities to collect neuro data without necessarily putting us into these MRI uh, tunnels that we had seen in the past. So it's becoming much more portable to be able to capture neuro data of the kind we want. And then finally, we are now using crowdsourcing data very intentionally to conduct mechanical Turk experiments that some of you may be familiar with, uh, where we pay people to answer questions, uh, to engage in, uh, in studies that we are doing, and all of this is a great way of expanding the participant pool, which until recently was made up of people in uh, what sometimes people joke that all our theories in communication come from studies done on stu undergraduate students in Midwest United States universities. Uh, but today we are able to go away from that label of what they call weird Western um, industrialized uh, democracies and able to talk to people from all over the world not just those who are Western or educated uh, and so on. And, and then finally, we can also get data from people, other sources like uh, Mechanical Turk. I was part of an effort that is called Volunteer Science. Uh, it's a platform that is now commercially available. It was built as part of a collaboration between Northeastern University, Bain University Northwestern, the University of Illinois, uh, as part of a Army Research Collaborative Agreement. And it allows you to just sign up and say, I wanna be part of studies and you can, and you'll get some uh, money for it, but you can do many different studies. <clears throat> and as a researcher, you can put your study up there and get people to participate in it. So it's a wonderful way to help uh, advance science. An example of another platform where we provide people with utility, not just money, and ask them then to uh, participate in our studies is this platform that I'm gonna talk about as a, called My Dream Team. So my dream team was an example of a platform where people put in information about themselves in classes, and then it can be used to provide customized recommendations for people on teams. So it's kind of like the dating app that I was talking about earlier, and people can exchange invitations and respond to assemble teams. We've used this now in over 400 classes, uh, and I'm happy to talk more with you about it, but you can learn more about it on this website. The study that I'll talk to you about is using this platform. So you'll hear more about this as we go further. And my favorite example is the unintentional way in which we are collecting digital trace data. So some of you may have heard of a website called Where's George? And Where's George refers to George Washington, whose uh, image appears on every single dollar bill in the United States. So someone came up with this crazy, funky idea. Why don't we create a website called Where's George? And we'll, on many dollar bills, we'll put a stamp saying, if you get this dollar bill, go to the website, dub, 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 dot, where's, where's George, and uh, put in the serial number of your dollar bill. 
and where you are when you get this bill. And so people played this and it was really funny. People would say, hey, I have this dollar bill today here in Evanston, but the last person who had this dollar bill was in Washington, D.C. or was in Los Angeles. And everyone thought this was a lot of fun. They took part to it, excepting my former colleague here, Doc, Dirk Brockman at Northwestern. He's now uh, in Europe, uh, in Germany. When he was on the faculty, when, when he was doing his dissertation, actually, before we joining our faculty, he said, you know, this is actually very interesting because it is a way to capture mobility networks. Because as the dollar bill moves from one location to another, who took that? Somebody actually had that dollar bill in Washington, D.C., and then it showed up in Chicago or in Evanston. So he used the data on this website that was, that was collected for a purely fun reason, but instead transferred it into a mobility network data set that then he used to study modeling the prediction of flu. So he began to use this for the H1N1 virus to see how the flu might spread from one town to another. Uh, that was written up in the New York Times. More recently, he did the same thing in the, in the pandemic. And so here you see creative ways in which data that was not collected for a particular purpose can then be repurposed to help us in a lot of other important issues such as predicting flu. Finally, people talk about big data in, uh, that is not available in the lab. Many of us have spent a lot of time working and collecting data in small groups, uh, and people think that's going to be big data. Well, actually, that is big data, because if you think not only do we collect self-report data from people who are in the lab in experiments, uh, but we also get server logs of what they are doing, what people see, what they do, and they chat logs, what people say. And so my colleagues and I wrote this article uh, in the journal Industrial and Organizational Psychology where we said little teams, big data. Big data provides new opportunity for us to theorize about teams. Uh, and of course, then my colleague at, uh, in computer science uh, at RPI, Jim Hendler says, we are now moving from, the, from big data to broad data. But the previous decade, he, he said the era of big data is so 2012. But now we talk about broad data. What exactly do you mean by broad data? Broad data is when you take different types of data about a person and you bring them together. So it's about mashing data. It's about taking not just a lot of data about one thing, but taking disparate data about a person and then juxtaposing them together. That's why he calls it broad data as opposed to big data. And then finally, in addition to looking at theory and data, we also look at new methods that have come about. Today, there's a whole new series of methods in networks called relational events modeling that has just mushroomed as a methodology. Why? because we now have digital trace data that provides us timestamp data of when Celine was sending a message to Daya exactly with a timestamp. That's the kind of timestamp data that we didn't have previously. And when we didn't have it previously, then there was no uh, need to develop methods for it. But now that we have this kind of timestamp data, there's been a dramatic increase in what is called as relational event modeling. Likewise, because we now have data about teams from um, millions of publications, for example, that are available on uh, Web of Science and other bibliographic databases, we now also have an interest in saying that networks by themselves are not very good at representing teams because if I have three people, I don't know if pairs of these people each rep wrote a paper together and that's why they're connected, or the three people wrote one paper together as an entity. And so the whole area has given rise to new methodology in what is called hypergraphs, uh, as opposed to normal graphs or normal networks, where you're able to draw a line, not just between two nodes, but between multiple people and say, these three people work together, or these two other people work together separately, or this one person worked by themselves. So the entire development of hypergraph has been something new that has developed as a result to uh, of our interest in studying collaboration, scientific collaboration networks at scale. Finally, I'll mention reimagining methods. Uh, well, not finally, penultimately, I'll mention we also have a lot of interest in what is called as computational modeling, where we can actually create in the computer a model of each individual and how they interact with each other individual. This is sometimes called as agent based modeling. And we are able to use this to simulate how people might be interacting. In, in, in a particular context and then see how well that could be used to predict. Uh, if we have time, I will, I'll give you an example of how we are using this to help NASA uh, predict how a crew will uh, behave in a space mission over the course of uh, a long-distance long space exploration mission to 
the moon and then on to Mars. Um, finally, I want to just touch, touch briefly on a couple of new approaches that have become important. Text, text analytics obviously has become a big way we're able to take our own ideas of content analysis that people in communication have been doing for decades, but scale it up to the point where you're able to do text analytics uh, at a very large amount by mining texts um, at a very high level. But then also look at the ways in which we are learning from, from, we are learning from machine learning. If you think about the ways in which we're doing machine learning, a lot of the systems that we use are black box. We don't understand what they are saying, but there are some that allow us to look under the hood, so to speak, and see the ways in which uh, these, uh, these approaches are actually giving us what are Boolean logic statements, which allow us to say that if there is some final outcome that is happening, it might be because of a set of conditions. This is not the way we normally think of hypotheses, where we say normally hypotheses is A is associated with B, or A explains the difference between X and Y, but there's no reason why we can't begin to hypothesize in ways that incorporate Boolean logics and say, if I want to accomplish why a person is satisfied, it could be because they have they fall into category A, they work during, uh, in, during these durations of time and they have this particular quality, or they could be happy if they belong to category B, but they have these other attributes that may in, uh, increase the likelihood that they will be satisfied at the workplace. So those are not typically how we've thought of hypotheses, but machine learning is opening that up as a way to rethink the structure of hypotheses we deal with. Uh, I will just say that we have to be cautious that we don't rely on a particular type of data like Twitter data to say, oh, we can learn everything about social interaction based on one social media platform, Twitter. Why? Because that's where the data is. APIs are available for Twitter. And so some people criticize us and say, oh, we, all we've done is not created a science of a science of communication, but all we now know is what is called as Twitterology, because that's where we get all of our data. So I think we have to be cautious not to do that. Likewise, we also have to be cautious not to focus on existing theories without allowing ourselves and liberating ourselves to say, we can rethink theories. We don't have to say, oh, I learned a particular theory when I was uh, in the PhD program, and so whatever phenomena I find, I'm going to see if I can use an existing theory for it. To me, that's like, in both cases, it's like the drunken man who only looks for the keys to his, the last keys to his car under the lamppost and says, I'm looking here because that's where the light is. So I encourage us to be much more creative and allow ourselves to reimagine theories and methods in this context. Now to the specific example of people analytics that I opened with. People analytics is basically a term that Google popularized by, as a way to reinvent HR. So this article in 2013 says how Google is using people analytics to completely reinvent HR. Uh, what question, and then, you know, this was an article in the New York Times, what Google learned from its quest to build the perfect team. And they spent two years studying 180 teams, the most successful ones shared five traits. The five traits that they shared were individual traits, things like a person having psychological safety, dependability, structure and clarity, meaning and impact. My talk today is going to be about how important it is not only to look at these psychological attributes, but to understand the communication as people who are interested in communication. What was the communication networks tell us about why these teams were successful? And so in collaboration with my former colleague here at Northwestern, Paul Leonardi, uh, who's now at UC Santa Barbara, we published this article in 2018, in Harvard Business Review called Better People Analytics, Measure Who They Know, Not Just Who They Are. And this who they know is where the networks come into the picture, where the communication and social networks come into the picture. In this, we say you can take people's old ways of looking at people analytics, which is just individual data, but we augment it with what we call relational analytics individuals network data, teams network data, organizational network data. And so just like in the case of a, a, a person who's interested in studying the brain, uh, you can look at an MRI or a microscope picture and see what is the difference between the brain of a healthy human being on the left and one who's afflicted by schizophrenia on the right. The same way we can begin to look at the organizations, but now instead of doing a microscope, we want to do a macroscope which means we want to zoom out. So we want to see these trees of who's interacting with whom, 
as we begin to zoom out, that's when we see the real pictures. So where do we get the data from all of this? We get the data by the, looking at the digital traces on our platforms, whether it's Slack, whether it's Microsoft Teams, whether it's Zoom. And in all of these cases, as we look at the data, the trails, the digital exhaust that we're leaving, that we're leading, we just know this is gonna become even more and more prevalent. Gartner had a study saying that the amount of day investment in data we're gonna get from these digital traces, from these digital platforms is going to double. And in fact, this was before the pandemic, it has already doubled uh, in part triggered by what's been happening in the pandemic. And so the, what type of data am I talking about? An employee sends a message to someone, sends a document to someone, badges or endorses someone, uh, likes someone, uh, sends an email to someone. This is all digital trace data that as we look at it, it allows us to begin to see what we call structural signatures. And as we talk about in the Harvard Business Review article, here are some very simple structural signatures that tell us a lot about what's happening in people analytics. In the ideation signature, if we see a person is connected to people who are not connected to each other, as we see out here, that tells us that this person is particularly well suited to come up with good ideas because she or he is talking to people who are very different from one another. If we look at this person here and we see that she is connected to two people who in turn are connected to a lot of other people who are in turn connected to a lot of other people, we know that this person is going to score high on what we call the influence signature. Just like it's almost exactly the same algorithm that Google uses in page rank to in terms of ranking search order results. The first search result we see in Google is not to a website that is pointed to by a lot of websites, not just that. It's the website that is pointed to from a lot of websites, which in turn, those websites are pointed to by a lot of websites and so on and so forth. And that's what makes for the influence signature. While these two signatures focus on individuals, the next two focus on the team. If I look at this team made up of these people, the fact that they are all well connected with one another means is that they are likely to be very efficient at what they do. This is a team that's likely to get the job done on time. It doesn't say anything about how well the job is done, but it will be done on time. If you want to say how innovative the team is going to be, you need to look at this signature here. And this signature says this team is going to be innovative because members on this team talk to people on the outside who are not connected to one another. And that's what makes them innovative. And then finally, at the organizational level, we can look at the structural signatures in the organization and see to what extent is the team si is the organization siloed, where everyone is only talking within their own department and there are very few connections between departments. Or you could look at the extent to which the organization is vulnerable to the outside. To what extent is the organization having connections to somebody on the outside, but that person on the outside who's connecting to many people inside the organization is connecting to people who don't talk amongst themselves. So guess what? Here is a person on the outside talking to someone in sales, someone in R&D, someone in marketing. And this person on the outside can put these things together and now has more competitive advantage than people in the organization because they were not talking to each other. So that's where you make, that's what we call the vulnerability signature for the organization. All of this can be used to do a variety of different things for the organization. It can help us do better when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Today, when we look at organizations, they're getting pretty good at coming up with diversity metrics. They can tell us, in my organization, I have a task force that is diverse in ethnicity, diverse in age, diverse in discipline. But what they can't tell us and what networks can tell us is not only how diverse your team or task force is, but how engaged are the people with one another on this. That's the inclusion part of the equation. Because when we look at the digital trace data, we're not only seeing who are the five people in the team, but we are seeing who's responding to whom in the team. This takes away the, the concerns that we have that often you might have three minority members on a team but no one really listens to them. Everyone is, everything is being handled by the majority members and the three minority members are tokens who show up on the diversity card, but don't really engage in the interactions or contribute to it, are not taken seriously. All of that can be captured through network trace data of relational analytics that we couldn't do otherwise. Second, we can plan for succession. 
Today, when we try to see who's the best person to succeed in another person, we look at their resume, we look at their CV, we see what are their individual qualities. And tacitly, we might say, oh yeah, this person is pretty well networked. Now we can begin to make that relational analytics information about a person, about a candidate, concretely part of the evidentiary base when we are choosing a successor, when we are planning for succession. And then finally, we all know that mergers and acquisitions are a major part of the economy today. And yet we also know that the billions of dollars associated with mergers and acquisitions often result in failures or semi-failures. How can we use the network's patterns within the two organizations that are either merging or one being acquired by the other? How can we look at these networks and see who are the right people who should be connected to increase the likelihood that this merger or acquisition will be smoother, more effective than it might have been. These are three examples of stuff we are working on right now. Uh, so I'm not going to give you empirical uh, evidence of what I'm saying here. But what I am going to give you empirical evidence is what we have been doing in the area of using relational analytics and making it actionable for teams. So I'm going to talk, if I can, depending on time constraints, on some research we've done on how we can use relational analytics for team assembly, team staffing, predicting team performance, and team conflict very, at a very high level. The first thing we have to ask ourselves is, in order to do this, we know from the past research that the influence signature, the ideation signature, what makes teams more effective, all of the data that we know points towards those signatures was collected on surveys, through surveys by researchers who did social network surveys. We also know that getting social network survey data is a real pain and it's a real nightmare. Why? Because it takes forever to get people to answer it. Most people don't want to answer those questions. It gets out of date really quickly and it's very expensive. So what if we were to do three things? What if we could have survey data at no cost, 100% response rate, and gets updated 24 seven. Well, what if we could do this, not by actually asking people to answer surveys, but taking the relational digital exhaust data that we've been talking about and seeing if we could use that to predict what people would have said on a survey, even without them actually taking the survey. So to test this idea, which is what we talk about in the Harvard Business Review article, we began to go to many organizations and say, let's see if we can predict what people would say on a survey based upon digital trace data that you could provide us. And one such study is, I'm gonna to touch briefly on here. This is, a, this is a study we did actually in a company in China um, that is uh, jointly headquartered in Shanghai and Beijing. And what we did, and we did this in collaboration with uh, folks at Fudan University School of Management. And what we did here was we collected data from 66 employees at a Chinese company that uses an enterprise social media platform. And we got digital trace data from them and we got survey data from them. And the goal was, could we take the digital trace data and predict what they said on the survey? The short answer is we can. And the way we were able to do that is by asking them survey questions like, this person provides me with a sense of person, who do you rely on for leadership? Pretty standard social network survey questions that people ask one another in organizations. Who do you go to for help or advice at work? But then what we did was we used statistical models, specifically exponential random graph models, which is a form of, of network inferential uh, methodology that allowed us to predict what the survey answers were based upon demographic data we had on the individuals as well as their digital trace data. So I'm not going to go into, more, into a lot of detail here, but we found interesting factoids. Employees who send someone one message per day are 15.2% more likely to say that person provides them with a sense of purpose. And employees who send 10% more messages than they receive from them from a particular person are 26.7 times more likely to say that that other person provides them with a sense of purpose. So you see that even the imbalance between people's messaging tells us who thinks of whom with a sense of purpose. The time delays between when I send someone a message and they reply also provides me clues about how much I think highly of that person or rely on that person for leadership. We took all of this data and created complex statistical models that I'm not gonna go into detail here, but when we looked at that, we found that whether it is for any of these networks, advice seeking, leadership, sense of purpose, 
we were able to do a pretty good job of predicting who would say someone provided them with a sense of purpose. In this case, for a sense of purpose, the accuracy was 89.4%. For granting leadership, it was 91.6%. In terms of who do you go to for help or advice, it was 78.24%. And we took this data and said, now we can create a dashboard where the input is the digital trace data. We run these predictive models that I just described and use that to come up with predictions of what people would say on a survey. And once we can make those predictions, then we can use these to learn about not only where somebody stood in the social network, but who was more or less likely to be influential. This is the influence network. Who's likely to resign in an organization, as well as who's like, this is the influence network. The first one was the ideation network. And then this is the influence. Who's likely to generate buy-in in the network? Uh, anyways, I'm, I'm in the interest of time, I'm just going to say that these approaches all rely on not bothering to ask people survey questions, but instead using the digital exhaust to predict what people would say on a survey, and then use that to design high performance teams, uh, as well as to, uh, uh, to uh, be able to make predictions. So now very quickly, let me touch on uh, the, uh, the research, including the one I promised you, I teased you earlier on about what happens when people are given recommendations of who to put on a team. So we all know that there are some dream teams that we all belong to, but the majority of us also will know that we belong to what I call nightmare teams, where you don't ever want to work with those people again because it was a nightmare. So the question is, how can we predict when a team is a nightmare team or a dream team? Uh, this is work I did with uh, three of my former students, one who is now a professor at the Annenberg School at USC, Diego, who actually now has finished, graduated, and he's doing a postdoc at the Kellogg School of Management here at Northwestern and will start next year as a professor at Notre Dame. Uh, and then Jackie, who was my former PhD student, who's now doing a postdoc at Harvard Business School. We were interested in seeing how teams form when they are self-assembled and when there is information given to them about the other people that they are choosing. So it's kind of like a dating situation. I go to a dating site, I know what I want. I'm going to. I'm, I'm the one who's going to choose my partner, my dating partner. But I have information about that person, and the system has information about me, so they'll help me make a good match. So the question we were trying to do is, who do you search for, who do you invite, and how does that person then respond? And so we wanted to look at the invitational network. Who do I invite to join a group to join my team? So we used uh, today, you know, we can do that in a variety of different approaches. So what mechanisms explain the invitation process? Uh, this, and we studied this in the context of this particular study was done in schools where people from two universities were taking a class jointly together, one in environmental ecology, one in social psychology. The goal was to have members from both universities and to simulate an advertising campaign to mitigate an environmentally sustainable issue. Uh, particip participants assembled into teams over the course of one week using a tech platform. In one year, we assembled 32 teams from 213 participants. In the next year, we assembled 31 teams from about 200 participants. And what we did was these people used the platform I was telling you about earlier called My Dream Team that was developed here. In this platform, people provided their own profile information about themselves, and then they began to say what kinds of teammates they wanted. They would get results and recommendations that looked like this. And then based on that, they could send invitations to their to potential teammate members. Uh, so our, in, our dependent and variable year was the who did you invite on your team? So that was the invitational network data. And as I showed you this diagram, we wanted to see whether you're more likely to invite somebody who was recommended by the platform, whether you are more likely to invite people who you had previously worked with. And then the key was, how did the familiarity that I have with someone impact whether impact the recommendation? So now to the answer that I first teased you with, we found that people did in fact take recommendations seriously. If somebody was recommended, they were more likely to be invited in both sample one and sample two. It was also true that what we know from previous work, if you work with someone previously, you are indeed more likely to invite them. This is the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. What was particularly interesting was a significant interaction effect between those you previously know and those who then appeared on your recommendation list from the algorithm itself. And what we found out here is if you look at, if you didn't, this is the people who didn't appear in the top 10. Clearly, if you appeared in the top 10, 
you were going to have more likely to be suggested, uh, more likely to be invited than if you did not appear. If these numbers here are always going to be lower than these numbers here. But the colors tell the difference. The red here is people who you had previously um, worked with. So they are much more likely to be invited than the blue who you previously did not work with. But if the person who you previously worked with was on the recommendation list, they got a little bit of a bump, not much of a bump. But if the person who you did not work with was on the recommendation list, they got a much steeper bump. So in other words, recommendations are more effective in getting you to invite people you did not know previously than in getting uh, invited people who you did know previously. Because if you did know a person, the recommendation didn't have quite as much an impact as it would for somebody you didn't know. We found this also true in the second sample. Very quickly, touching on uh, one more example, and then I'll stop there with that, Celine, in the interest of time, uh, team staffing. And this to me is a very exciting example because it is focusing on what happens as we decide to go to space. Uh, as you all know, humans are about to become an, an interplanetary species. NASA is well on its way to sending the next, uh, the, the first female and the first colored person and the next man to the moon as part of the Artemis mission in the next two to three years, and then on from there on to Mars. And so as we begin to go on these long duration space missions, we need to recognize that a journey to Mars is going to take about a year. And because of the way the orbital dynamics work, you can only, you have to wait on Mars for almost a year before you can swing back and on the shortest route back to Earth. Otherwise, you'll have a very long trip coming back. And so if the trip back again is taking a year, we're talking about a three-year mission between six people potentially from different cultures who are put into a small confined space, and there's no voluntary exit from this team for a three-year period. So what this means is that you have to work autonomously because as you get closer to the, uh, Mars, it's going to take 22 minutes for a message from Mars to come back to Earth. So the old adage of Houston, we have a problem uh, that Apollo 13 encountered is not going to work in this case. You have to work very autonomously there. And so we have to think of a team that it really is going to get along well. In the old days, when people went to Antarctic, uh, the people who volunteered to do that were tended to be people who were basically mental, uh, not, uh, who, were, who were technically skilled, but social misfits. Because um, they said, what the hell, I have nothing to lose. I might as well go to Antarctica. I might die. But if I don't, I might become famous as being some of the people involved in the first expedition to Antarctica. Today, that's not true. People on, who are in the space station are seen as very socially savvy people who work well together. And so our goal, the challenge that we were told was, how can we put together a team that will, go, that will work well over, over extreme conditions on a long duration mission? Psychologists said, here are the kinds of characteristics you need to look at. As a social networks person, I said, yeah, but if you really want to make the dream work, which is what Scott Kelly said, you need to look at the networks amongst these people. And so we began to ask the question, what happens to teamwork under extended periods of isolation and confinement? Well, it would be nice if we could have a Petri dish where we could put people in to a small confined space for hundreds of days and watch them do complex and boring tasks and monitor them physiologically and psychologically for 24 seven. And as many of you would know, no institutional review board would allow us to put people into those crazy conditions to study them. However, that is exactly what we are doing because NASA puts people into these kinds of confined environments at the Johnson Space Center for 45 days at a time. And we as researchers funded by NASA get to do all the things that I just mentioned, physiologically and psychologically poke and prod them. And we're not the only ones doing it here. The Chinese have what they call a lunar palace, where they're doing a similar study. In fact, just this past week, a couple of weeks ago, we are doing a study now uh, in collaboration with the Russian space agency, <coughs> excuse me, Roscosmos, where they have put into this facility that you see out here in Moscow, six people, not these six, but six people, uh, including uh, three Russians, two Americans, and a United Arab Emirati uh, crew member, and they are just got into this place and they're going to spend 240 days in that space. And we get to study the dynamics in that team. So as part of that, what we've been doing is collecting data from these individuals. And the network data that we collect looks like this, where we ask them, who do you get along with 
And we ask them these questions every few days and we see they tend to get along with everyone well. But then we ask them this question, who makes tasks difficult to complete? And lo and behold, we find that this crew member at the bottom is the target of everyone saying this person makes tasks difficult to complete. But this person doesn't seem to realize that, every, that everyone feels that way. So what we did was we built a computational model using a lot of social science theory of different types of variables that we put in together. And we then put this model into an Asian-based model where we took real data and used that to parameterize the model and then began to, do, to see how well we could predict what was happening. And lo and behold, what we basically found from this model uh, that you're seeing out here, this is a platform called NetLogo, which is a very nice computational Asian-based model. And the nice thing is we use real data to build the model, the data we collected from the crew members. And when we did that, we found that we were able to make very good predictions of all the different factors that influence crew relationships, crew networks. Uh, for example, people who are self-monitored, high in self-monitoring, were more likely to be seen as someone that other people got along well and less likely to be seen as a hindrance. People who were having a huge amount of workload were not likely to say they enjoyed working with other people, not surprisingly. And basically, in the interest of time, what I'm going to just say is we began to do, began to both train these models and then test them in different contexts. And here again, found that our accuracy was in the 0.7 range in this question and the 0.744 range in terms of hindrance. So I, I, what I want to say is that these are all ways in which we began to predict what people were doing in teams. And then NASA came back to us and said, that's not enough. It's not good enough to tell me that A and B won't get along on day 30. How are you going to fix it? So we then began to do prescriptive modeling, which I will, which is which I don't have the time to talk about today, where we repaired individuals who was going to work with whom on a task over the course of a few days when we saw that they were not getting along well. We repaired them with other people and we used that to repair their relationship. So it's a play on words. We were repairing individuals and tasks in order to repair their relationships. So I know I'm at the top of the hour, so I want to pause here, but I hope what I've given you is an opportunity to see how the kinds of digital trace data and the survey data that we have is dramatically changing the ways in which we can both understand the changing nature of work, but also importantly, enable that changing nature of work by creating algorithmic recommendation systems and seeing how that impacts the ways in which we do this. I will stop with that and Thank you all for listening to me and happy to take any questions. Um, uh, I don't know, Celine, do we have time for questions or is this the end of the hour? Yes, we have still have, uh, have an hour for the question session. Oh, you have an hour for the question session? I have an hour. Uh, half an hour for the question session. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm open to questions. I have more slides, but I, I definitely want to give priority to questions first. And then maybe some of the slides will come in as part of that. So. I'm, I'm all yours. Thank you so much, Nasha, for the really enlightening and fascinating talk. Thank you. Yeah. So now let's open the floor. So if you have any questions, you are welcome to raise your hand and you can ask directly um, just by the camera. Or if it's not convenient for you, you can just type out the questions in the chat box and I'll read it aloud. There we go. Okay. We'll stop the sharing and we do have a question already. Yeah. Now, we have... says, it seems simulation model is popular in social science studies this year. Computer science think it can provide us a network level overview on social interaction while sociologists always question the data made by algorithm is able to really simulate and reflect the actual world. How do you think about it? Mao Xu, thank you for asking me this question. I'll tell you a little story. My own background uh, before I got my PhD in communication, my undergraduate degree was in electrical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras in India. And um, as, an, as an electrical engineer, we did a lot of work with simulations uh, for understanding uh, you know, uh, networks, but electrical networks, communication networks in the, in the hardware sense of the word networks. And so when I came to do my PhD at USC, I took a class on theory construction and my instructor was actually Peter Manji and Kathy Miller, one of his uh, PhD students. And I wrote my paper on how we can use simulation for theory testing and theory construction and build theories in that, in that way. And I remember Peter saying, you know, in the social sciences, um, people had tried to dabble with simulations 
And uh, sociologists really question exactly Miao Xu as what you're saying, Adia. Sociologists question, can we really do this? And, and frankly, there was good reason for it. Uh, there was a very popular study at the time called the Club of Rome study, which was building a world dynamics model on uh, looking at how simulations could help us predict what the future of the world would do. No modest uh, goal there. And the study, which was called the Club of Rome study because it was funded by the Food and Agricultural Organizations, which is headquartered in Rome, they basically predicted based on this very complex computer simulation model using systems dynamics, which was before we had Asian-based models, systems dynamics. And what they basically concluded was that the world was going to a hell in a handbasket. They said that by, the two, by 2000, the world would be completely struck with hunger. There would be famine. We would have no energy left. We would have, everyone would be dying of uh, pandemics uh, and um, there would be no food for to survive. So, and there would be no energy and the climate would be terrible. And so this, this report got nicknamed as the Club of Doom report because it was such a doomsday report about the world. Well, it turns out, Obviously, people questioned it and said, how do you reach these conclusions? And how, how do you decide what factors will affect what? The parameters, for example. Like, remember I showed you a model where I said, oh, self-monitoring has so, so much of an impact. Cumulative workload has so much of an impact. Those parameters for us, and this is really at the heart, Miao Shu, of your question. For us, the parameters that we use in our model didn't come from our head. It came estimated from the data. We use genetic algorithms to estimate these parameters using actual empirical data. In the old simulation models that were done by social scientists, including the Club of Rome, those parameters did not come from actual data. Those parameters came from talking to experts. And of course, experts may disagree on what, how important each of these factors might be. And so what happened was that because the Club of Rome, Club of Doom report got such a bad press that people overwhelmingly said, simulations is great for people who are engineers. It doesn't have any place in the social sciences. And Peter Manji, when I wrote that paper for his class, wrote on the side of that, he said, sorry, but in social sciences, we've already tried this, been there, done that. It's not going to work. Move on, find something else you want to work on. And I did. And then the interesting thing was that when Peter and I were began, to write, began to write the book, Theories of Communication Networks, Peter came, this was about you know, 20 years later, Peter came to me and said, you know, remember that stuff that you've been doing? And I continue to do work in, in this area of simulation. So even though I thought it, others, it was not very popular, but I still continue to publish. I published an article in human communication research talking about how we could use this to model networks. And then Peter came back to me and says, you know, it's been 20 years. And I remember telling you that simulation was not very popular. But given this kind of stuff you and not just me, but others were doing, we should have a chapter in our book about using computational modeling for networks. And hence was born chapter four in that book that some of you have read. And what was interesting is that he said that he wanted to write the first draft of the chapter, which kind of surprised me because at one point I thought he was thinking, no, no, this is not a big deal. He wrote the first draft of the chapter and then we continued to edit it. And since then, agent-based modeling has become really important. But the short answer to your question, Ma, is that if, in my opinion, this is not widely, I won't say it is the dominant approach, but it is certainly my opinion, that I think agent-based model has a lot of credibility in the social sciences if the model is parameterized using actual empirical data. That means it's using exactly like what weather forecasters are doing. We use actual data to parameterize the model to see all the different factors that might impact a particular future scenario. And if we do that, and I think the space example is good evidence that if we build those models, we got, we built a model with one crew, we got a brand new crew, we use that model to predict it, and we were very good at making those predictions. That's the difference between the training data and the test data. And we tried that with the third mission and the fourth mission, and we kept getting to the point where after a while, we, our models were already so good that we didn't need more empirical data. The model built on five or six of these data sets was sufficiently good to predict the seventh, eighth, ninth, and 10th mission with no added uh, empirical data needed. So that's the short, long answer to that wonderful question. So thank you for that question, Mark. Yeah, meow, I'm not sure if around. Thank you, okay. 
Yeah, I think Daya yeah. has a question. Yes, thank yes. you. Daya. Thank you. Good, good uh, to see you also again, Daya. So thanks for thank coming. Thank you. I'm sorry I've not been going to I ICA for the reasons that we all know, but good to see you virtually at least. And I hope uh, some, I hope you will think about coming to, I mean, you and the rest of you will uh, consider coming to ICA that, that in is, Paris if that's possible. But we are also doing a regional hub that uh, I want to talk to you about so that if some of you are not able to attend because of vaccine issues or uh, economic issues, et cetera, um, I'm very keen on talking uh, with your university in particular about hosting a regional hub um, at uh, for ICA uh, that uh, will allow you to collect there and also be connected electronically uh, time zone, uh, you know, with the time zone caveats there. We so would, we'll talk more about that, but that's we, not why we're talking right now. Sorry that, that I had we, to... we would be very interested in that, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, so I have to say, this was the most fascinating talk that I have attended in many years. Oh, thank you. Partly Sarah. because this is not a field that I know a lot about, but this is amazingly fascinating, especially what you were saying towards the end of your talk about Mars and, uh, you know, how you getting the right pairs together, whether it's culturally or individually. Fascinating. Um, the problem I have with this approach is that it is too scientific. And uh -huh. human, human beings are not necessarily that scientific or rational. They are quite emotional. They can change their ideas. They can, yes. their mood swings. So we get into the realm of sociology, psychology, or perhaps exactly. most, most importantly, culture. Right. Um, so how does one deal with that as a as a uh, as a uh, as a hum as a social scientist or human humanities person forget your uh, computing background for a moment that's one question mm -hmm. the other question is also what um, professor zubov called the surveillance capitalism the, capitalism. the fact that exactly. yes yeah. that the data is also a commodity in today's world people talking about data uh, colonialism, various versions around the world. Uh, and then there's authoritarian versus democratic internet and the kind of you know data localization debates and data sovereignty. There's a lot of debate about that. Uh -huh. And in your formulation, none of that seems to feature as if this is happening outside those parameters of power relationship between the world of digital uh, connectivity. So I'm just curious um, uh, what you have to say about, about that aspect also. And there was final thought on that. There's also the case where people are not real people, they're machines, they're trolls, they're, you know, they're, this whole system of, um, you know, whether doing opinion survey or it's not humans doing it, it is a machine doing it. So yes. that's the other aspect which I wanted to briefly touch. Thank you. No, no, these are all very, very good questions. So let me, uh, and, and uh, first of all, uh, I, I think I was hoping to get questions like this. I think the, the, motive, the, one, of the uh, one of the motivations for me to give a talk like this is to be provocative and engage in the kinds of questions that you're raising. So let me try to take them in order. Uh, the first question is, you know, you're making humans into an automaton, you're creating a virtual avatar of that in a computer and you're giving it certain characteristics and then, uh, but people change, you know, and, and I think you're absolutely right. So then why am I doing this? Well, it turns out that there are two things to keep in mind here. Um, the fact that we are getting this amount of predictability is both sobering and scary at the same time, right? It's, I mean, in some ways you go, wow, this is great. I mean, it's like the weather, I'm able to predict it. But then that's, that's me as a modeler saying, wow, I was able to explain this much variance. But as a human being, I, I agree with you. Am I really that predictable? Am I really, uh, can I really be, can I really be so, uh, you know, pre well, predictable, I guess is the right word for it. How is it that I'm able to that, do this? It turns out that we are far more predictable than we normally like to believe. Uh, and this has been shown again in other studies in terms of mobility. Uh, people like Lazlo Barabashi and others who study mobility networks on a day-to-day -day basis using uh, location detected from uh, mobile devices that we carry with us 
has found startling statistics about how much our mobility is, though we have the freedom to move, that 90 plus percent of all our mobility is highly predictable on some periodic basis, whether it is daily, monthly, uh, daily, weekly, monthly, and so on. So I think one of the things this is showing us is that freedom of, 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 of action and thought, while we preserve the right to exercise it, is not one that is exercised as often as we want. That said, the second part of it, which I think is exactly where you're right in, in pointing us, is that he is what I call the uh, social science version of what in physics is called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So in physics, uh, Heisenberg's big sort of revelation was that the act of observing changes what is being observed. In his case, he was thinking of throwing light on particles and if you want to throw light on a particle in order to see it, because if you don't throw light, you can't see it. The dilemma is that the moment you throw light to see a particle, that light has enough force to move the particle. So you're not seeing the particle where it was, you're seeing the particle where the light has moved it. And I think that applies so much more to human behavior. The act of being observed changes it. Not only the act of being observed, but the very fact that I'm telling you now that self-monitoring is associated with uh, certain kinds of behavior. Now that I know that, I might change my behavior just by virtue of the fact that I know that's what the prediction was based on. And I think that that is where the second order learning, the, what some people call second order cyber systems comes in, where awareness of certain facts changes the ways in which we do things. And it's no longer there the previous, it's no longer how we used to do that. And that's going to be an eternal loop for us. That problem just got tougher. And this speaks to the last issue that you raised. And that is, we are not acting as humans in a vacuum. We are acting based on these algorithms, based on the recommendations. And so that, again, is something that is not in our control because companies change the algorithms routinely. And so to what extent am I doing, is social sciences today understanding human behavior and how humans act, when in fact, how humans are acting are increasingly being influenced by algorithms that are being designed, and in some cases, black boxed, to tell us what we might want to do and nudge us in different areas. And that further limits our human autonomy in these situations. And, and, and to me, that is the new frontier of trying to understand social systems, where we are no longer just understanding systems of humans interacting with humans, but humans interacting with autonomous agents, which yes, they may have been initially designed by a human, but then now have a life of their own, have their own logics. It's not that they are being programmed by the human, right? They're not being programmed to say, if A does this, you should do this. What these algorithms are doing is, here is a whole bunch of data you go build a model on the basis of that, and then you tell the human what to do. So no programmer knows what that system is going to say. That's, that's the black box part of it. And to me, this is definitely a challenge that could be good. I mean, in some cases you could say, well, if this machine learning algorithm is gonna tell the doctor whether I have to make a diagnosis of what kind of cancer or what kind of ailment I have, well, and if it's doing a good job of that, that could be very helpful. However, many doctors don't wanna use it. Why? Because they say, it's telling me this recommendation or it's, it gives me this diagnosis, but this darn algorithm doesn't have what some doctors called the why button, W-H-Y. Why are you telling me that this is the diagnosis? And that's part of the black box. And sometimes these AI tools don't have the ability to tell you why. They just say, this is the prediction I made. Now, do we always ask every person in our life about why or not? I think that's, 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 that's an open question to ask ourselves. We don't always ask. We do trust experts, but trusting experts is one thing. Trusting a black box a machine learning algorithm uh, is quite another. And then, of course, that brings us to the third issue that you raised about um, capital, you know, the surveillance uh, capitalism uh, economy that we live in. And that's an absolutely absolutely central issue. I think it's also related to uh, 
the, the some of the the question that I think I see here from uh, Yuan Hang. And so let's talk about that a little bit. To me, in the article that we published, we actually had a box section specifically talking about the privacy implications of what we are discussing, because it is it is absolutely the most, it's it's the elephant in the room that you cannot get away from. It is it is part of our lives. And it's not just something that we are saying that is so extraordinary, because in many different facets of our life, over the last two decades, we have grudgingly traded privacy for what we perceive as potential benefits. And I underscore what we perceive, which in some small local interest way might benefit us, but in the collective good has undermined us, has hurt us, has, um, has impeded our ability to accomplish certain things, has relinquished our power to corporations in many cases. Uh, and these are debates that we in the field of communication need to constantly and rigorously engage with. Um, there have been studies, even experimental studies. Um, I know of studies that were done by uh, my colleague Joe Turo, for example, at the Annenberg School of Pennsylvania, who did these very carefully conducted experiments where he said, um, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like you to share your data about your location or about your age or your demographics. And, uh, and then he changed the amount of incentives that were provided to those people in exchange for that data. I'll give you a discount on this. I'll give you 10 free hours of this. I'll give you these kinds of search results. I'll give you these kinds of bonuses. And the bottom line is that humans for better and for worse seem to have a calculus about what they're willing to trade in exchange for information. In some cases it's obvious, right? I'm sitting here, I'm trying to get directions to go somewhere. Google says, may I have access to your current location? And you go, well, of course, that's, if that's what it's gonna take for you to tell me how to get from where I am to some other location, I will give you access to my current location. There's a trade-off. In that case, it's, a, it's an easy trade-off that many people, not all, but many people are willing to do. The same logic is one that I think we need to use when we think about people analytics. And that is, if you are, collecting these kinds of digital trace data. So from a legal standpoint, the government, uh, most, in most, most governments give organizations the right to collect data about employees. We sign those rights up. In fact, some people joke that we basically, anytime we work into an organization, we leave our democratic rights at the doorstep to the organization. Because when we go in, we sign things that say, yes, we're gonna use your platforms and you, in principle, have the right to access those data. Having the right to access those data is not the same as whether that's the right thing to do or not from an ethical point of view rather than from a legal point of view. And so I, to me, I see a lot of what is going on in this context as basically asking the question, what, what is in it for the employee? How can we empower employees by providing them this information? And so a lot of the work we've done, every organization where we've collected this data we provide each employee with a confidential, customized, private report about how high they score on ideation, how high they score on influence. How does that benchmark with others in their team? How does that benchmark with others in the organization? And go the extra step to say, if you are scoring high, how could this help you? How could you leverage this to be more uh, productive in different contexts? Or if you're not scoring high, what are the kinds of things you could do to improve your network, to leverage your network? We find that giving that kind of information confidentially to each employee increases their willingness to be able to share these data because all of the data we collect has to go through consent form. Every employee has the right to say, no, you can't use my data, my digital trace data. And every employee has the right to say, I'm not gonna answer your survey. These are things that we have to abide by in terms of our own institutional review. So our goal is to incentivize for them how to do it. And we find that these approaches seem to work. And I say this only because in many of these organizations, we've collected data at multiple rounds. And so the fact that we've got higher response rates on round two as compared to round one is because each of the individuals who got these individual reports find it valuable. They ask us questions. We have a town hall session 
We have private sessions with them to give them an idea of how to make sense of this. And then we also separately generate organizational reports where we completely anonymize and aggregate the data so that no individual information is revealed, but we give the organization some insights about the level of siloness, for example, or their vulnerability and so on. Um, I, I don't see we have the answer. One, ad, one other advantage of giving the information back to the individual is because it could be that the, the individual and, and can come and look at the data and say, this is not my network. You got me wrong. The digital trace data you have on me is wrong. You, you assume that I was using um, WhatsApp, but actually I was using WeChat. And so we think that the other reason why it's good to give the employee information is that they can actually be a gut check to make sure that we are not misrepresenting them. Uh, the analogy, as I see it, is in the United States where we have data on credit scores for individuals. And there are credit rating firms that allow you access to what your credit score is. And every now and then, someone will find that their credit score has plummeted because somebody engaged in uh, identity theft and took over their, uh, their number. So the same kind of logic I think we need to bring in here. We had very early stages of trying to understand how our data, that we have access to our data, it's just as in the larger debate about these issues, and what we can do to make sure that we fix issues when our data is not is misrepresenting us. So again, I, you know, I, I just, um, I think that this is such an important debate and I certainly hope our field will continue to uh, engage, uh, engage in these issues. I, I just have to say as an aside to you, Daya, that before I take on the next couple of questions that have come in here, um, I've been doing a podcast to go along with my uh, conference theme that I set for ICA this year, which is the conference theme is the phrase one world, one network, followed by a question mark and an exclamation mark on top of each other, which we call the Interrobang which both celebrates and problematizes the notion of one world, one network. And my, one of my conference, uh, um, uh, conference team co-chairs is Herman Wasserman uh, at the University of Cape Town. And we've done a podcast series based on this, on this conference theme. And I hosted the first one where I introduced our conference co-chairs. And then every subsequent theme is hosted by a conference team co-chair. And um, the one that was hosted by Herman Wasserman features you very heavily in that. Uh, that is going to be, it's going to be released uh, in the next, uh, I think in the next couple, week or two. Um, and in it, there is a very uh, robust discussion about contraflows uh, and about uh, contributions that you have made in helping us understand why today uh, these kinds of issues are happening in the context of, uh, including, you know, with uh, the most recent uh, 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 Korean uh, Netflix show. I'm blanking on the name, help me, uh, which is a very popular Netflix show from- Squid Game. Squid, Squid Game. Game, Squid Game, exactly. That's the most recent exquisite example of, of content flows, et cetera. So I, I had to, I had to uh, mention that because I was going through the transcripts uh, of the recording um, and, um, and so you'll be featured heavily in that uh, in that episode. Harman is, Harman is a dear friend, an old one, so that's what friends are for, I suppose. It's part of the network. Right? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a couple of questions here. Um, Yuan Yuan Hang asked a question about integrating digital trace data and survey data is becoming a new trend, which seems to provide more insight than the analysis of only digital trace data. The logic of data collection is largely different between the two. So which kind of data enjoys the priority when we collect the integrated data? It's dependent on specific research questions. How about the issue of demographic representativeness? Yuan Hang, another excellent question. Are you folks are really on top of it? So the integrating part of it has become popular in organizational network analysis. The term that gets used in this context is what they call active network data and passive network data. Uh, active network data is a label used for people who collect uh, survey data actively from users. Passive net network data is the term that is used to talk about the digital exhaust or the digital trace data that I'm talking about. And indeed, there are many who are uh, arguing for being looking at both of these together. Um, and I think that, that that's the right thing to do because they make that, you know, they essentially are addressing two separate questions in networks. One is behavior, which is what digital trace data is doing. And the other is cognition. That is, what is our perception of it? We know from decades of history in social networks that there is 
that people often will self-report network connections that are at variance from the actual behavior. And then the question is, which is more correct, which is more accurate? And I will submit, uh, just as Yuan Hung is raising here, that one is not better than the other. Depending on the kind of network question you want, uh, one might be more important than the other. For example, if I'm interested in who is a broker, uh, having behavioral data on who a person connects with and knowing that they connect with people or not connected with each other definitely tells me with some definitive um, confidence who is likely to come up with good ideas, the ideation signature that I talked about. But it turns out that very often brokers don't know that they are brokers because they have not perceived the network to realize that they're talking to people who don't talk to each other. What does that mean? It means that they don't leverage the actual advantage they have. And the only way we would know that is by collecting a survey and figuring out that they don't really know about the fact that they are bridges in a network. Sometimes a person can be a bridge without knowing it. And then if they are a bridge without knowing it, they often don't seize the opportunity because they don't see that opportunity. So I do agree with you that a lot of work needs to be done on trying to find the balance. I think at this point, the state of the network science is where you are saying it is. We need to look at both, both are important, but the question that you're asking, which is more or which is more important in some conditions and what are the cases where one is more important than the other, that remains work for people like you and others to uh, other students to the next generation of network science uh, to take on in this particular case. So that's a great question and, and thank you for asking that and I'm happy to continue that. Uh, I'm gonna jump to the next question here, Jan asks a question from Manila, I hear two questions. First, how can weak social type possibly explain interaction effect in the recommendation study for informed team formation? That's the interaction hypothesis you're talking about. And second, in what ways can we test the algorithmic affordance of the workplace in general and relational events network in healthcare organizing in particular? The first one, how can weak social type possibly explain the interaction effect in the recommendation study? I think, um, I don't know if you pronounce your name. I I'm assuming you pronounce it Jan. I could be wrong. Uh, I think the way it explains it is it basically says, I am willing to listen to technology more when I don't have other evidence available to me. If I know Celine well, and the system is telling me I should go to Celine. Yeah, I might say, yeah, you know, that's good. I'm, I, it's, I'm glad that it is it's mentioning that. But there may be things that I know about Celine that will make me discount what the recommendation is saying. Because it's, I'll say, look, I know Celine personally. I can make my own decision about Celine. I don't need to be, I'm not gonna be as persuaded by the recommendation about Celine, who I know, as compared to someone I don't know. I'm much more vulnerable to a recommendation about someone I don't know than for someone I know. It ties back to what go in, in our field we refer to as uncertainty reduction theory. I'm much more likely to rely on other sources to reduce uncertainty when I don't have that information. But if I know Celine and I have information about her, then an outside recommendation is not going to be quite as influential as it would be for somebody who I have a high degree of uncertainty about. So to me, I think that's sort of where I would, I would uh, land on that first question. On the second one, what ways can we test the algorithmic affordance in the workplace in general and relational event networks in healthcare organizing? I'll give you an example of a study that uh, was done by my colleague Paul Leonardi in testing the algorithmic affordance in the workplace. So he was interested in looking, so this study was done at um, a famous, uh, a fairly famous company that, uh, is in the, finance, in the financial business, credit cards, things of that kind. And what Paul did was he was able to go into this organization before they introduced uh, enterprise social media. So in the app, before the technological affordance was introduced to the company. And he asked individuals in the company how confident they were about in answering questions such as who knows what in the company. So, you know, it's basically, think about the people in the organization. Think about these different people. How confident are you about what are their different areas of expertise? Not their job titles. What do they really know something about? The 
sometimes you can say, you know, yeah, I know that so-and-so is supposed to be the head of this division, but I also know tacitly who is the other person who really knows what's going on in this area. And so he asked them these questions about how confident they were about who knows what and about who knows who in the organization, who's connected to whom, who's, who's well, who works with whom well, who gets along with whom, who trusts whom, et cetera. And then what he did was he waited for the rollout of the technology of the organization. And his hypothesis was, if the rollout of this technology is going to give people the technological affordance of increasing their level of association, their ability to know who knows who and who knows what, he went back into the organization and asked them the same set of questions um, about six months after the rollout of the technology. And what he found was exactly what you would expect. He was testing the algorithmic affordance hypothesis in this organization, and he found that the introduction of this particular set of enterprise social media, of this enterprise social media platform, had exactly the predicted effect, that all of a sudden people in this organization were much more likely and confident about saying who knows what and who knows who knows who. And so that's one example of how we could be doing this uh, obviously, as you have more relational events data, uh, that makes it much more precise about the nature in which you could be doing these. Uh, I have a current a student right now who's working on his dissertation with the data that we have collected. <clears throat> and his interest is in leadership networks. How does having uh, enterprise social media platforms change the ways in which people look to others as leaders? And I'll give you a very trivial example but I think it'll help stimulate the, uh, an idea about this. Once people use ESM or enterprise social media, things like Slack, things like Microsoft like Teams, what happens? I now see, let's say that Daya is, my, Daya is my leader, but I now see how other people are looking at him as my leader. And so all of a sudden, because this is now semi-public information, there's chats, there's liking, et cetera, what it has, the, the affordance here is it provides greater visibility into how I appraise a leader based on how I see other people looking to this person as a leader and how this person as a leader is treating other people. That's now a level of technological affordance which can have a tangible impact on the leadership network. It's no longer the old days, you know, there was uh, in, in, in uh, communication studies, there was something called the leader member exchange model or what is called the LMX model. The leader member exchange model in communication is a very dyadically based model. It basically says, I can understand leadership by looking at a leader and a member as a dyad and trying to understand how well this relationship is going to work. Today, that dyad is not working in a vacuum. That dyad is part of a system of a lot of dyads where each dyad is observing every other dyad in that network, how the leader is, is engaging with other followers, how other followers are engaging with leader. And making this so much more visible in enterprise social media fundamentally changes the ways in which leadership networks emerge, they are maintained, and how in some cases they might be dissolved. So I don't know if that provides another sort of concrete example of the ways in which we can test these models. Again, great question. So thanks for asking that question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nashia. So I think we are about the time. Uh, actually, the time is up. And I really want to say thank you again, a big thank you to Professor Contractor. Uh, as Daya said, I really think it's one of the amazing talks uh, we attended this year. So we, we learned a lot and we are really looking forward to having you in person here um, and very in the very near future. So we are looking forward to having you here in person. I, I, am, I, I, am, I am looking forward to that as, as well, very much so. And again, I salute all the excellent work you're doing at Hong Kong Baptist and what you're doing. Um, contributing to ICA, and uh, y'all have been amongst the champions for the ICA podcast network that I have talked about. And um, and I, 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 ICA as a whole, on behalf of ICA, let me just say we are grateful to your institution for the support that you're providing us as well. So thank you all very much for joining us. I can't believe we have, what, 33 people, even though we are eight minutes behind the schedule here. So I'll let you get on with the rest of your day. Hope you have a wonderful day. 
And um, I, I hope I have a wonderful week ahead as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.